Hello, everyone. This is Catherine Baer at River Network, and we want to welcome you to our webinar today about water trails. It's about 5 before the hour, and so we will be getting started right at 2 o'clock Eastern. And um, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. This is Catherine Barrett, River Network. I just want to let you know that everyone, um, we're just waiting for everyone to get on. We see people joining right now. So thanks so much for joining us on our Water Trails webinar today, and we will be getting started um, right at the top of the hour. Hello, everyone. This is Catherine, Barrett River Network. So welcome again to the webinar. Uh, we have a good number of people joining, and so uh, we'll give a minute or so more to let everyone get on. And as you know, you're um, using your computer audio speakers or calling in, and um, everyone is muted, so you can use the chat box to contact us if you have any questions. We will be getting started in just a minute or two.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on water trails. Uh, this is Catherine Barrett River Network, and we will still a few people joining on. So it's 2 o'clock right now. We are going to go ahead and get started. Um, may have more people join us as we go. But um, so I just want to thank everyone so much for joining us today. I'm really excited about this webinar. And just as you've been seeing on this screen, um, you can use the chat box for questions, and we will. The speakers will be taking questions later after their presentations. Um, so feel free to um, use that chat box, and if there are clarification questions, we will stop, but otherwise we'll save them until the end. Um, and then we also will have a survey at the end of our webinar. So if you could fill that out at the end, we would be greatly, greatly appreciative. Um, help us improve these webinars along the way. So thanks so much for being here, and we are going to go ahead and get started. So um, again, my name is Catherine Baer, and I'm here with my colleague April Engel today. We work at River Network. We want to welcome you to the webinar um, as our organizers today. And we're really excited to be here with our colleagues from the National Park Service for the Water Trails 101, Get on the Right Course, and Learn the Secret to Success. Um, for communities, and this is a new topic for me, so I'm super excited to hear it too, and hopefully for all of you who either may have experience with this or be at the beginning, um, it'll be a great overview, and we'll also provide a number of resources as follow-up. And so for communities across the country, water trails are a flexible and responsive tool for promoting a healthy economy and a high quality of life while preserving natural and cultural heritage along many of our waterways. Um, in today's webinar, um, the National Water Trails Learning Network will step us through the phases of water trail development, discuss the challenges and success, successes faced when creating and sustaining river access, and dive into a case study of a successful national water trail. The presenters will provide links to existing tools and time for um, conservation around established water trail best management practices. And so, before we start, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about River Network. Some of you are, are members of our network, and we invite all of you to join us. Um, we are a national organization that we connect water-focused nonprofits, agencies, and businesses around the country for greater impact for clean and healthy waterways for people and for nature. And we do this. We've been around for 30 years. You may know us through these webinars and through our annual River Rally Conference. Um, and so. We work across the country to, with many groups that are working at the local and state level. And these are groups who may be at the, the forefront of either establishing national things like national water trails, but also fighting for clean and safe drinking water, um, or working um, with their local community on installing rain gardens and rain barrels, or working on a river basin level to ensure healthy flows um, for fish and wildlife. So we're really a backbone organization. We connect people across the country working to do this work. Um, and so we hope that you'll consider, consider joining us in our efforts to do that. And um, thank you again for joining us um, joining us today. I want to note our partners in, in this webinar, two great webinar sponsors who we work with um, frequently on a regular basis. Um, first is the National Water Trails Peer Network, which is a peer-to-peer -peer network of managers from the more than 20 federally designated national water trails. River Network coordinates this network with the support from the National Park Service, Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program. Our second sponsor and partner is the Urban Waters Learning Network. And the Urban Waters Learning Network is a separate network of people and organizations working to restore and revitalize urban waterways and the socioeconomically challenged communities that surround them. This network is co-coordinated by River Network and Groundwork USA with the support of the Environmental Protection Agency. So we have two wonderful speakers today. I'm super excited to introduce them and turn the show over to them. Um, first is Allison Bullock, and she has served as a community planner for the Ch uh, Chattanooga Field Office of the National Park Service's River Trails and Conservation Assistance Program since 2000, providing technical assistance for trail and conservation projects in Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama, and North Carolina. Allison is a graduate of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, with a Master's of Science in Planning, and she's a past recipient of the Great Outdoor Weeks Legends Award and a graduate of National Park Service's Mid-Level Management Development Program. And over the past decade, Allison has developed an expertise in planning water trail projects and also enjoys getting out on the water herself on her sit-on-top sit -on kayak. Our second presenter is going to be Brian Leaders. 
Um, Brian is a graduate from the Iowa State University um, with a degree in landscape architecture, and he has spent the majority of his professional career involved in land planning, land development, and erosion control design throughout the Midwest. Uh, he sp specialized in low-impact development consulting, land planning, and the design of nature explorer classrooms for children. He joined the National Park Service Rivers Trail Conservation Assistance Program in 2010, where he works since then and has been working with community groups to develop multi-use trails, river trails, greenways, and conservation projects. And he's the project manager for Iowa, Kansas, North Dakota, and South Dakota. So we've got two great different perspectives from different places in the country. So I'm going to hand it over to Allison to get us started. Um, and before I do that, though, I'm just going to launch a poll so we can find out from folks um, what different um, things you would like to learn about. So we're going to launch this poll right now. All right. Can you all, uh, can we see that poll coming out? They'll send me a chat message. This is April. I cannot see it, KB. All right, let's try to launch that one more time. We're all good. It's showing the results, not the... <laughs> okay, you know what we're going to do? We are going to come back to that. What we're going to do right now is that is not working quite right. I am going to send this over to Allison to get started, and we will try to launch that again later. Thanks, Catherine. Um, and thanks to River Network for hosting us today. Uh, it's great to have everyone joining us from across the country, and Brian and I are really excited about sharing some of our experience and, and knowledge of working on new, numerous water trail projects. Let's see if I can get this forwarding. So Catherine, you might need to help me out here. It's not advancing my slide. Hmm. There we go. All right. So um, I just wanted to quickly uh, share with you, you know, kind of a definition I use for water trails. Um, you know, I really look at water trails as a network of public access points along rivers, shorelines of lakes and oceans. Um, you know, there could be a variety of places where you can find water trails. Um, and they're primarily for canoeing and kayaking for recreation endeavors. Uh, we call them lots of different things in our country. Um, some call them water trails, some call them canoe trails, but we are hearing other terminologies now like blue ways, blue water trails blue trails, can, you know, there's just a lot of um, variety out there as uh, people become creative about how to brand their, um, their water trails. So how do we get started with a water trail project? Um, I always recommend forming um, a planning team by gathering together partners and stakeholders from the very beginning of the process. Um, you need to be able to think about everyone who might be involved in either the planning stages or the implementation stages and try to get them um, brought on board and to the table early on. Um, don't And don't be afraid to include people who you might think um, were outside of the reach of your pursuit. Um, you know, if you're trying to develop a canoe and kayak trail, um, you might also want to Allison? include your... Yes. You want to refresh your screen? I think we're having trouble seeing your screen right now. I'm just seeing the um, the, uh, the blank. It? How do I refresh it? Do you know? Um, why don't you let me do this? So your thing is up there. Let me um, let's change presenter back to me really quick, and then I'm going to pop your screen up again. Okay. Just get it to reload. Okay, so I'm going to come back to you. We apologize for our technical difficulties. Okay. Yep. There we go. I can see it now. All right. Very good. Uh, as I was saying, you know, reach out to your fishermen, um, rafting companies, motorized boating groups that are out there, and also include other stakeholders to your process who um, already might know the river really well. Um, it may be 
uh, companies on the river or um, ma uh, water trail management companies um, or organizations and public land organizations. So there's a lot of different entities um, to consider and try to reach out to them early on in the process. So once you have your team in place, um, it's really important to kind of define the scope of your project through um, developing a vision, um, some goals, and especially the geographic focus of your project, which may sound silly, but um, you know, if you have a river um, that you're working on, you know, where is your project starting and finishing? Um, is it the whole reach of the river or is it um, the whole watershed or is it limited to one particular scenic section uh, that you really are trying to highlight? I typically suggest forming three committees associated with your project. You might end up having to develop more down the road uh, for specific tasks, but um, a mapping and access committee, a communication and marketing committee, and an organizational development committee um, have served the projects I've worked with really well. Um, and I really find that a lot of groups uh, worry about whether they need to start a new organization right off the bat to do a water trail and I recommend that you either find someone who's willing to take the lead as a, an organization or um, just push um, just hold off and form a partnership early on um, something very simple and formal um, and see where things go uh, put the effort in um, a little further down the line you really spin wheels on that So our next phase, um, I think of as an inventory phase. It's really the, how do you get to know your river? Um, you know, where do your access points exist? What's the river like? What are your key facilities, infrastructure and services? Um, in this process, having somebody who understands mapping and GIS is so important. Um, to have help from, um, you can either go through the de a development district, a university, uh, or local government, um, or a public agency might have those capabilities, but bring somebody into the project that has that expertise and develop a map um, that's gonna have the paddler in mind, um, not necessarily the outsider, but somebody who um, you know, is going to be getting on the river and using that tool for navigation and planning their trips. So some considerations um, you want to keep in mind when you are doing your inventory is identifying how difficult the skill level is of your river. Um, are there obstacles, uh, hazards? Um, is there a dam uh, that may control river flow and you will have river flowing a couple days a week uh, or certain times of year? Uh, those are really important things to understand during this process where you're really trying to assess the river. And after you've completed the mapping of what exists, the next step is going to be doing what I call a gap analysis, um, where you're really looking at what else you're gonna need to make your project a success. Um, are there additional access points you need or facilities like parking, um, maybe a campsite or two, uh, and where might you be able to put those? Um, so actually sitting down with the map and, and laying that out and setting some goals um, is really important in this stage. Um, we often use a tool um, like this to do our inventories on site. Um, this one, um, you know, you're going to your access points and you're taking data on each access point um, that you can then put into your GIS system. And then that can be mapped out later on when you're sharing information with the public on, you know, what type of ramp or boat launch do you have in this access point? Um, how much parking is there? Do they charge a fee or allow overnight camping? Uh, these things are really important to try to understand from the beginning. So once you've gotten all the data collected and you started developing this gap analysis, um, the next stage is really going into more of a design phase and you're going to be trying to figure out what additional facilities need to be established and what those are going to look like. And I always start looking at the river at, with the low, what I call the low hanging fruit, uh, where a section is already in place that you can focus in on and establish that as your first section of your water trail. 
um, you know, a good section might be, uh, you know, for a river, five miles, um, six miles, something like that, where you have a good put in and take out, you have your signage and, um, you know, you are able to implement something in short order. Um, and that process you'll be repeating in different sections throughout your water trail. But you're going to want to meet with landowners or land managers on site and, and figuring out how you're going to uh, co-manage this project. Um, do you need an agreement or an easement to use it um, or any kind of permit? And um, what kind of funds are you going to need? Um, and you're also going to be looking at a design of your facility um, needs that are going to be in place. So you want to um, look at it. There's a really good guide that River Management Society has on their website called Prepare to Launch the RTCA assisted in the development of that has all sorts of tools associated with it to help you figure out what kind of uh, launch facilities you need for access. Um, but we try to take into account, um, you know, looking at how we can accommodate disabilities when designing our access points. You can't do that in every situation, um, but the more we can um, really think about that in our mind at the beginning, the more we're able to figure out how to do and, um, and expand this as a really viable opportunity for people who have limited mobility. So you want to um, also think about, do you need an engineer at this point if you're going to be developing an access site? Um, you know, what kind of water flow do you have? What are the water dynamics of the river? Um, and do you need an engineer involved? Um, I found a lot of projects don't need an engineer unless you're getting to the point of putting in a more formal ramp of concrete um, or you have some sort of technical issue you're trying to overcome. But a lot of projects you can do now with volunteers and um, someone who has some uh, general um, construction experience. Um, and we're really um, seeing good success with that. So the next stage of planning um, is really one that's been going on the whole process uh, behind the scenes. And this is your um, through your communication and marketing team. It's um, looking at how you're going to promote and communicate your project to the outside world. Um, you know, we usually think about um, at this point having a logo that's specific to your project and the branding, as they call it now, um, how you're going to brand your project, um, your, your trail. Um, you want to look at signage for your trail that would incorporate that branding. And a lot of projects nowadays are um, developing separate signage plans for their projects um, to look at signs for um, bridges or entrance signs to access areas, um, safety signage that are closer to the launches, um, signs with maps on them, um, and other wayfinding features and interpretive features. Um, when you're developing your promotional materials, you really need to think about that fact that a lot of the people coming to the river are going to be first time paddlers with no experience whatsoever in paddling. We're finding this more and more as um, kayaks are becoming uh, readily available and inexpensive that more people are getting into the sport just by going out and buying one and taking it to the river or the lake um, to try it out. So the more educational information we can provide um, through the websites and through signage, the better. So in this day and age, the biggest thing we use for um, communication tools are the website and social media. And most of my projects now have separate websites associated with them. Uh, a couple of them have uh, a couple of pages um, that are integrated with another website um, where they share a platform. But um, a website is an essential tool now and being able to incorporate the latest technology with interactive GIS mapping has really taken what we can communicate to a new level. Um, I like to be able to set it up that um, people can go online on their home computers and be able to actually print out something um, from their home computers. 
that they could take with them if they wanted um, or download it onto um, their phone through an app. Um, this is becoming more and more common. Um, we're every day less and less doing printing of guidebooks and brochures. So um, although a lot of them still do that. I also like to encourage my project partners to host events to get more people out and engaged in the project. Um, and I, I, one of the things I like to do is a, what I call a VIP event with, um, I've got a project not too far from where I live, um, the Hiawassee River. And we get all of the people that help fund the project and um, the land managers and the media out on a, a day on the river. And it's a great experience and it has um, really uh, paid off in a big way. So I think another thing that's really important to point out as you're going into the implementation of your project is that this takes place over time. Um, you know, you might have sections that you build upon um, over years, um, but you know you're ready when you have certain elements in place. Um, like, do you have your signage already in place? Or do you have good access in place? And do you have maps um, either online or available for your project? If you have those components in place, um, you know, you're probably in this realm of getting ready to launch a project. Um, one of the things that project partners often fail to think about is that long term responsibility of um, having a water trail. And that's your operation and your maintenance, um, how you're going to long term manage the project. Who's going to be your coordinator? Who's going to lead it? Um, how are you going to do maintenance of the project? Um, do you have a volunteer core that you can pull together and send out when there's been a heavy rain and you look for log jams or, or clean the mud off of the ramps? Um, you need to be able to um, be uh, plan for being responsive and plan routine events as well um, to keep your project uh, free of hazards and trash. So many of you may be familiar with the National Water Trail System. Um, it started about five years ago uh, through the National Park Service. And um, the National Water Trails Program developed seven best management practices that are required by um, applicants um, in order to receive designation. And so I've shared those here on this slide. Um, and there's additional information on the last slide of uh, where to find it. Um, if you're interested in applying. The next application date is November 1st. And I wanted to include some ideas for funding your projects. It's always um, you know, important to know where you can go and find resources. Uh, I just encourage people to think outside of the box and it doesn't always have to be cash to be a beneficial contribution to your project. Uh, we have projects where there's volunteers, uh, companies that step forward and volunteer to manage a website, for instance, or, um, you know, do um, graphic design for us. So, you know, it's, think outside of the box of what your needs are and how you can accomplish that. And this last slide is um, just some of the resources that I uh, use regularly for my projects and to find information about other areas of the country and what's being done on water trails um, that I'd recommend to you. Um, several of these are state resources of some of the um, states that have really exceptional projects at a statewide level. Um, you might also contact your state trails coordinator and see if there are resources in your community or state as well. So I look forward to questions and um, I'll turn it back to our moderator. Yeah, and um, I have some quick question for you. Um, there was a question that came in that said, do you have an inventory template that you use or can make available? I do. Um, so I do two different inventories. Um, I do an inventory of the land-based assets and then I also do a floating inventory where it's more of what to see from the river and, and kind of taking account of, you know, when there's overhead wires and things that you can use for navigation purposes where you can identify hazards. So I'd be happy to make those available. Okay, great. That's, thank you so much. Um, we were able to redo the poll. So I think um, April is going to launch the poll for us. April, here we go. Okay. So everyone just saying wants to answer that real quick, that'd be great.
We still have some answers coming in, so we'll just wait a few more seconds and we'll show you all the results. Great, it looks like we're just about got everybody. We've got, let's see, well, we've still got a few more. We'll give everybody one more second here and let's go ahead and see what our results are. So it looks like about 38% say access and design, about 8% say communications and marketing, 10% in conservation, 23% um, kind of an even split there between community support and planning and trail maintenance and organizational support. Very good, so all on the map, but some high points there. Okay, perfect, so for num uh, National Park Service, that's a good indicator of where the interest lies. Um, okay, so Allison, thank you so much. Um, we are going to keep moving. I am going to um, move this over and let uh, Brian show his slides. So, Brian, I'm moving it over to you. There we go. Okay, good. And Brian, we can see your slides, but we cannot hear you right now. Oh. I just no. unmuted okay. you, Brian, so you're all set. Okay. Okay. Yes. And can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. All right. Great. Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, the poll that you just answered, I, I hope I touch on every piece of that and answer many of your questions. But if not, we'll have uh, contact information for you to reach out to us and be happy to answer any questions that we can. Um, what I want to talk about today is basically tagging on to exactly what Allison went over, but in a real life example. Um, what I will talk to you about is the Kansas River and uh, the Kansas Water Trail that I worked on back in 2011-2012. Uh, we did get it designated as a National Water Trail. It was the second one designated through the National Water Trail system. That project uh, was 174 miles long and it uh, traversed a large part of the north third of Kansas all the way from Junction City into Kansas City. So a little bit about the planning team. Um, we had a we had a rather large planning team. These are the major players. Uh, I, I can't list all of them, but Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism was our applicant and our main partner. Um, we also had a group called Friends of the Caw. Uh, Caw is short for Kansas River. Uh, it's a nickname that they gave it many a years ago. So if you hear me say the Caw River, it's the same river. Uh, so us as the National Park Service, we had a group called West Art Energy. That is the local energy company that uh, they provide services through their green team. It's a volunteer team that uh, they worked on many aspects, a lot of kiosk construction and so on. And you'll see some examples of that and I'll talk about them a little more later on. Economic uh, Development Corporations of Kansas were a big part of it. We had 15 communities along the river that all participated, as well as all of the contacts uh, or major players from the seven counties that the river uh, runs through. So the primary partner, Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism, they, uh, we gave them a number of roles. Uh, we wanted them to be the lead. We did not, as the National Park Service, want to be the lead on this project, uh, but we wanted to be a major partner in help guiding them. So um, they were the lead agency. They provided staff and staff support. They were a big part of the funds gathering uh, aspect of it. They uh, provided funds through the state and they also provided through uh, grants and they also raised money in partnership with the local communities. They also acquired land for access points if it was in public ownership. Uh, a number of access points were in public right-of-way or public parks, and therefore they did not need to acquire. Um, they were a big player in developing the brochure and the kiosk panels. 
and uh, the Park Service worked very closely with them on design and information and review. We also um, worked with uh, KDWPT to manage the construction of a few of the access points, and um, I guess I should rephrase, uh, rephrase that as we didn't help on the management, but we did help on some placement, uh, some of the design, and also uh, finding locations that worked the best. And then we uh, worked with them to develop a long-term river management plan. So um, when it comes to river inventory, as uh, Allison said, um, there's a lot involved, especially on 174 miles of river and almost impossible to cover it all just with a few people. So um, the main thing that we did is uh, we had the state provided through the Parks and Tourism airboats for us to do uh, surveys along certain sections of the river. We also relied on our local communities uh, and local paddlers to provide information as well. Uh, so we took that information and, and gathered it. Um, we did create, through uh, a GIS plan, we did create a map of the entire river. These uh, numbers you see, 1 through 30, are pages. These were 11 by 17 pages uh, that we created all the way along. And um, we used aerial photography. We also used local community uh, maps and what have you for streets. The river project, uh, we the mileage was based on starting at zero at the confluence with the Missouri River and working its way up river. So you can see the blue numbers there in the river. Uh, these, these numbers are the river miles. We also uh, marked what existing boat ramps uh, were there. And then we also, when we went through the planning portion of it, looked at what type of accesses were needed in between those and uh, where those accesses were needed. Um, I, I will uh, just mention as well that this was not just a one or two year project. The state and the Friends of the Caw and many other people will have been working on this for several years. Uh, 2011 and 2012 were the two years where it all really came together and the partnerships started working uh, to finish this project and to get it uh, designated. So access planning and impl implementation. Um, so again, we used the maps and we, we sat down um, in groups and talked about where those access points needed to be. Um, we come up with a mapping plan. The yellow numbers that you see here are based on river miles and access location. And uh, so the P uh, was for a specific uh, location that related to uh, the name of the park or L uh, was for Lawrence River uh, Front Park and so on. So the letters referred to the location or a specific um, entity in that area. The numbers, so if you see E6, E4, and so on, if you were on the river and you saw this sign, it would mean that you are six miles up river from takeout letter E uh, and whatever that represented. So we put together the maps. We um, studied the river as far as what side of the river was best for the access point. And uh, oftentimes we were basically stuck with where we had uh, public access or land that could be purchased. So we had to had to work with that. Friends of the Caw was a major player in these uh, access points. They um, had a few people that were very experienced and actually had worked for the state of Kansas in building uh, access points years ago. And so they took on the task of managing and having these installed. The people you see in the upper left-hand corner were guys that actually took their four-wheel drives out on the river and, and drove through the sand. They're called mud runners. And um, they were asked one day if they would be willing to help uh, protect and build amenities for the river uh, instead of just tearing it up all the time. And they were all for it. So they become builders of the river um, access ramps. They helped tie rebar. They helped place rock. They also uh, came in and helped pour the concrete and build the sites. Um, 
some of you that are asking about building access points, the picture to the top left, that is a, uh, I think a 70 foot long slab poured concrete with rebar. Once that is hardened, uh, we, we had uh, the energy company that was providing equipment, they came in with the D9 cat and they pushed that slab down the ramp and into the river. And then they finished pouring the uh, ramp the rest of the way up. Uh, Kansas, as you may know, has lots of limestone available, and so limestone was used uh, throughout most of these access points for tables, for uh, parking blocks, and so on. Um, this image shows on the left a site that we had looked at initially near the town of Bellevue, Kansas. And uh, the picture to the right is basically the same picture about nine months later. Uh, this was an area where people would go, and you can see the shotgun shells in the left picture. Uh, people would go there to drink beer and shoot their guns and throw out their trash and so on. And the city of Bellevue said, what better way to clean up this area and to use it for the, the good of the public? And so this became uh, their access ramp. This is another picture of a before and after. The uh, ramp and the, the slab that I was talking about pushing in is, is this ramp. So uh, it turned out very nice. We had a governor's paddle after all this was done and all of these people coming off uh, were there for the governor's paddle. So it worked as a great takeout point. Many of these river projects, or access uh, river projects were done in partnership with the local community uh, but also done in partnership with many other entities. And so signs like this were posted and you can get an idea of how many uh, groups were involved. The really neat thing about this is just about uh, all of the access ramps that were done in the last three years of this project. So uh, 2010, 11 and 12 um, for a roughly $80,000 ramp, they got most of these ramps installed at no cost. The materials were donated, uh, the labor was donated, and the equipment was all donated. And that was all uh, raised through either the state or Friends of the Caw project. So the state over a number of years since 2002 had uh, put $800,000 into this project to make sure it was going to be a good viable project and the local communities uh, nearly matched that money over that period of time. A little bit about the signage. Um, this is an example of, of the kiosks that were built. These were built with uh, telephone poles, and matter of fact, the uh, West Star Energy has their own mill, and so any used telephone poles, they milled them down into full dimension lumber. And uh, on weekends, they had a green team that made up of volunteers that came in and built these. They also provided equipment, so they would bring their trucks down to drill the holes and set the posts. Um, one of these kiosks exists at all of the access points, uh, along with the ramp and the parking areas. The signage that was uh, put up for wayfinding was uh, also developed through the plan. Um, the one there to the left, the brown one is along a highway, and we actually got them put out along the interstate as well. And uh, those signs were purchased through the funding that was raised. And uh, the mapping was done very similar to what we did for the river. Um, this, is, this is a study, the study that we had done for the river signage, but we also did a wayfinding uh, on land signage plan as well. So where we needed a sign, we put a red dot. If we needed a left turn arrow or a right turn arrow, we put a different color dot and so on. So these are uh, examples of what the signs are. So um, for instance, you can see Bellevue and that would be a letter B. So this sign would be a B. And then this would be a B2. So if you were two miles up river from that access point, you would be, uh, you would know that you're two miles from Bellevue. Um, this map is part of the brochure that was put together and it would be downloadable and printable for people getting onto the river so they would have uh, those directions with them to be able to guide them as they uh, traverse the river. 
finding places to put the signs up was not always the easiest, uh, but we got it done. And so by airboat, we went out, marked sign or marked sign locations, and then uh, chained them high up into the trees so uh, high water events did not take them away. For the map development, this is the map that we put out. I can provide it to anybody. You're welcome to uh, get a copy of it or take a look at it for an example. There's lots of information on here, so I won't take the time to uh, go through that. So finally, a river dedication was done in 2012. We had the governor of Kansas and we had the Ken Salazar, the secretary of the Department of Interior, as well as other dignitaries. We did a river tour. Uh, with airboats. We did a dedication in Manhattan. We also did uh, a public service announcement, which you will see the video here in a few minutes. And uh, we had it open to the public and we had several hundred people come out for that dedication. So we're going to talk about promotion. I'll turn it back to Catherine for a minute. She'll play that quick video. It's about a minute and a half long, I believe. Okay, and actually, let me give you a question real quick while I move that sure. over. Question to you about, do you have issues um, with right-of-way regulations when placing your signage along roads and highways? Oh, absolutely. Um, no matter what state you work in, there are right-of-way regulations. Um, state of Kansas, DOT, uh, we work with them very closely. They were um, actually very easy to work with on this project because it was a state project. Um, but you, you absolutely have to work with your state and your county and your city um, crews that uh, design and install these signs and decide where the placement goes before you even think about putting any signage up. You want to get their approval. There's no place like Kansas to really connect to the outdoors. Big activities, big spaces, a lot of fun. Right here in the Kansas River, the Kansas Water Trail. This is the second water trail in the United States of America. It is the best. The Kansas River Trail features 173 miles of winding lazy waters, wildlife habitat, and natural beauty, and is one of the world's longest prairie rivers. For information about recreational trails in Kansas, whether for hiking, biking, or on the water, visit TravelKS.com. Okay, hopefully you saw that. I did not see it on my screen, but hopefully everybody did. If uh, not, or if you want to be able to see that or get a copy, I'd be happy to provide it to you. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, talk a little bit about promotion. Um, the state of Kansas has a web page. They have a page that is desig uh, designated for the river. Um, they have lots of good information on there for anybody interested in uh, paddling the river, you can go there and find uh, the maps and all sorts of things. Uh, the other thing, the neat thing about the Kansas is we have a second water trail. It would be the Arkansas River that was just designated as a national water trail last year. So uh, they should have a web page up for that as well. So as I mentioned, the governor's paddle, uh, this was part of a promotion where the governor wanted to have an annual paddle and he invited people out from the public and everybody that was involved in it. And uh, people brought their canoes and kayaks and we all paddled um, for a half a day down the river. And uh, we put in at one of the new access points and we took out at one of the new access points. We had uh, boats provided by friends of the CAW and also they did uh, guiding tours as we went along and talked about the different aspects of the river, conservation, and uh, so on. After the project was complete, the governor formed a governor's committee. He wanted to make sure that this uh, water trail existed for a long time and stayed uh, usable and all of the access points uh, were maintained. So what we uh, ended up doing through the Governor's Committee is uh, pulling together a group of representatives from each of the communities. Each of the communities agreed to take on their access point for maintenance uh, in partnership with Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism. We dedicated uh, access points along the way through the Governor's Committee. 
we worked with the local communities uh, on operation and maintenance. Uh, many of them are in community parks, and so for them it was fairly simple uh, to take it over. Uh, they also wanted to incorporate other things, so they wanted to put educational information out there about rain gardens and water quality, water quantity, and, and so on. And you'll see other signs uh, that talk about wildlife and what you'll see along the river. So that's it in a nutshell. I'd be happy to answer other questions. Hey, Brian, thank you so much. Um, a comment from someone came in and said, um, in Pennsylvania, we have an agreement with Pennsylvania DOT to place signs on bridges facing the river on all designated water trails. We also have an agreement about converting building platforms at bridges for new water trail access points. That's awesome. That's um, rarely heard of for many of the states. Um, even so, so this person mentioned putting signs on the bridges so people on the water can see them. Um, that is definitely something you have to get approved as well. And many uh, states or counties will not allow any signage to be bolted onto a bridge. It has to be done with a strap around the leg or by a chain hanging down or something like that. So that's a good point. But always, always, always talk to whomever your jurisdiction is when you're looking at signage and make sure you have an approval. And I want to tell everyone quickly too, I got a question about this earlier, is that the slides for this um, presentation as well as a, a fact sheet from the National Park Service, a 101 on water trails, is under the handouts tab on the webinar. So I don't know if you can see it, it says handouts too. If you click on that, you should be able to download both the presentation as well as the, um, the, the fact sheet. Okay, other questions? Let's see what, please. Ask your questions. Let's see what we got coming in. Uh, let's see. Hey, Brian, are there any water gauges along the call? If so, are the readings available on the Water Trails website? That's a great question. I am not sure. I can find out. Um, if you want to email me, I can get you in contact with the right person. Um, there are, oh, I should rephrase that, there are gauges. I don't know where they are, uh, and I don't know what is posted. Um, I know a local river that uh, I used to use quite a bit had gauges, I think, about every 20 miles, and those are posted, and um, uh, it's slipping my mind where where you would go to find those, but they should be, they all should be on the same website. Um, I'll try to think of it before we're done today. Okay, great. Uh, so what other questions are coming in? April, do you see other questions? Um, so one, one question, KB, and I'm trying to figure out the answer to is, um, Corey is saying that he doesn't see the handouts tab and I'm not actually seeing it either. Um, so I, and I'm not, and I went in to check on the back end to see what that might be going on. So I don't know if you have a, the ability to check on that. Um, and then Corita is, um, has offered, you all may be able to see this, but just to sort of reiterate some important points that she's making, um, Georgia and Tennessee have some similar um, for signage and access. So you might look at those resources as well as the Chattahoochee River Water Trail has gauges and info um, if folks are interested in that example. Um, the handouts can be found on the audio tab is what, which I'm not seeing. Someone said I can see the handouts in the handout section above. So if you all okay. see there should, um, I'm not sure exactly what participants are seeing, but um, you should see a, a, um, a tab on the right under above chat that would say handouts, that's where it is on mine. Um, and otherwise, if you can't see them today, we will try to send them out. Um, there's a drop down in gray is what someone, is, Corita is saying. So I think that's where it is. But we can also send them out in an email afterwards. Yeah, you have to click okay. that triangle on the left side of the gray bar that says handouts. And they'll drop down. 
At least okay. that's the way it did on mine. It worked on mine. Okay, good. But it's working for some. <laughs> okay, I did find um, where you go get the information for water levels. It is on the USGS site. Um, it is USGS current water data. And you can click uh, on the graphic area top right. You can click by state. And then you can also then, I think, drill down by river. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. All right. Other, let's see. Yeah, other questions? Um, uh -huh. Let's see. Okay. Have you considered developing a safety sign message that can be used by all? And that some safety issues are different depending on the type of river, but then again, there are universals regarding on water paddler safety. Yeah, so quite honestly, there are a number of those out there already uh, that are put out by a national group. Um, and I, I can make that available as well. Um, I, I can't remember the group. I think it's the American Canoe Society, Canoe Association, so the ACA. Um, my guess is if you go to their website, you would find that. Um, it does talk about uh, personal flotation devices. It talks about, uh, I think, getting in and out of your canoe or kayak and, and so on. Um, the, the th I'm not sure what, that one doesn't talk about it, but I know a big deal that a lot of people talk about now are dams and uh, notifying people when to get out instead of uh, getting too close to the dam and so on. We did that on the Kansas River and that brochure that I showed you, we talk about uh, safety and dams and, and we have signage on the map and we have signage on the river that says take out now, you know, move to the left, take out uh, at the next exit and so on. And um, that was a big, big deal for this project is how do we make sure uh, people are safe? We talk about on that brochure water levels and uh, what to look for if you show up at the boat ramp and how can you tell if the water is moving too fast for you to get on if you just show up at the boat ramp rather than having uh, the information from one of the gauges. And so we talk about what to look for and how to make a determination whether to get on or not. Um, I guess the key to that is, is if it looks like it's moving a little too fast, don't get on. If you are uh, new to canoeing or kayaking um, and you're not sure whatsoever, don't go on unless you have experienced people with you. Uh, become experienced before you want to go out on your own and uh, take some chances. Good point. And uh, Corita and others are putting in some good links here that we can share, but they're in the chat box about some of the paddle sports safety infographics, which may be helpful Great. to everyone. Um, okay, good. Other questions in for Allison and Brian. Have you worked with handicapped or veteran groups to improve access? Allison, you want to take it? Um, I personally have um, not had direct experience working with them, but I've had several project partners that have. Um, and uh, some there's a, a veterans group um, in Clarksville that's been working on the Red River um, Water Trail. There's um, in the Cahaba River, there's an area um, physical rehabilitation hospital that um, has a lot of um, injured veterans associated with it that have been working on the Cahaba River Blue Way in central Alabama. Um, so there are um, some good examples out there. I bet Creed is loading us up on her end um, with examples as well. There, but, yeah, there we are. Have, Correct. There are a number of people out there um, that are willing to partner with groups to take a look at existing uh, access points and also future access points. Uh, Mike Passo, for example, president of the National Trails, I hope I got that right. Um, he's a great resource. Um, and quite honestly, there's there are people in every state that are working on this uh, and willing to provide you information. Okay, good. Yeah, and 
So people are um, suggesting, yeah, Team River Runner Vet is another good resource. Um, okay, other questions for, for our great speakers? So one thing we'd like to know, and you can put this in the chat box, is uh, if we are able to um, have future webinars on national water trails, are there certain topics you'd be interested in diving into more deeply? And so if you'd like to put suggestions in the chat box, that would be much appreciated. So Allison or Brian, other things to mention or things to dive deeper on while you have the floor a little bit? here before as we're waiting for more questions to come in. Allison, go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you. If you have anything. Um, no, I um, I really think that accessibility is becoming more and more important on our water trails um, and putting more effort into how can we make um, access more accessible. Um, it is challenging, but there are so many new technologies, new um, adaptations uh, available that I think it is very worthwhile to look into um, for your local project to see how you can better accommodate this population um, because there's a lot more people that have limited mobility than we when, than we think. Um, I know that Janet uh, Zellner, I believe, did a really good webinar a year or two ago on accessibility and um, she might be somebody to bring in if there's interest in diving into that topic again. We, we do have other examples available from our national staff. Um, we've got a project that we've worked with the disabled American veterans um, to create a portage trail over an Army Corps of Engineers flood control dam. We've uh, worked with the state of Georgia, uh, working with them, writing their uh, state DOT plan. So there, there's a lot of um, information available. It's just It'd be hard to give it to you right now, but um, please email us. We'd be happy to get you more information. Great. You can see Allison and Brian's um, email addresses right there on the screen. Um, getting some good future webinars, including the challenge of private property owners providing public access um, and working with outfitters who might serve as gatekeepers. Um, accessibility sounds like an important one legal liability discussion so good um yeah, yeah li as well. liability is a challenging one it's very state specific um it, there are different liability laws in each state but um you know i've done some research in that area too we could definitely um, look at something in the, down the road that focus more on that and if you're an outfitter or working with outfitters, I have experience with outfitter as well. And so uh, if you're looking for any information related to that, be happy to help you out. I also um, just unmuted Karita. I thought, Karita, you've been putting in some great resources and just wanted to see if you had anything you wanted to add as well. Sure, this is Karita, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks Allison and Brian for those great pictures and stories. Um, I just added, and, and we'd be happy to share these, I think as Allison said, accessibility um, is a big question that's coming up. And we have three folks that we've been working with um, who have been talking about both physical accessibility and also not just the site design, but how you inform people who may be coming out and coming to your water trail, how you inform them about the experience that they will have. So. Um, in the next six months, we'll have some additional guidance coming out about launch design and inventory, as well as at the International Trail Symposium, we'll be doing some uh, a water trail workshop where we're looking directly at some of those access points and talking about access for all. So just wanted to, Janet Zeller, who Allison mentioned, also will be there. So wanted to bring those to people's attention. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm going to put to the next slide. Just um, These are some resources. We um, will send these out as well as a follow-up, um, but just some resources and a great 101 um, from the Park Service about 
some of these water trail resources. So, and again, these will be available afterwards. Um, so don't feel like you need to write them all down right this moment. Um, I don't know. So we're probably close to wrapping up. Allison, in, um, any final comments? For Corita? No, I'm uh, glad to have everybody here and uh, glad to see lots of interest in it. So feel free to reach out to us. That's what we're here for. Yeah, agreed. Yes, thank you very um, much. Yeah, I mean, with that, Allison and Brian and Creed and uh, Lilia, thank you so much um, for this great webinar today and great resources. And thanks, everyone, for participating with us today. Um, we've got some more upcoming webinars. We hope you'll join us for those as well. And you will see um, an evaluation coming your way as well as um, some follow-up resources coming to you tomorrow, I believe. So thank you so much on behalf of River Network and our partners at um, National Water Trails and um, the Urban Waters Learning Network. So hope everyone has a good afternoon. Thank you.